welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Well, you've probably seen it in the movies. The hero flips through a book at lightning speed and then recalls details only a careful reader could have discovered. Now, most people think that's all fiction, Hollywood fantasy. But my guest today says it's not only possible to optimize the human brain to read faster, remember better, and accelerate learning, it's actually something everyone can do. Holy cow. So Jim Quick is the world-renowned brain and memory coach, consulted by Fortune 500 companies, billionaire CEOs, celebrities, and even Harvard University. He's also the CEO of Quick Learning, the host of the Quick Brain podcast, now the New York Times best-selling author of Limitless. Upgrade your brain, learn anything faster, and unlock your exceptional life. So on today's episode, Jim and I are gonna talk about what makes a better brain, how technology may actually be holding back our minds, and Jim's number one technique for learning more effectively today. So Jim, it's so exciting to have you on the podcast. Thanks for, thanks for being here, this is great. Dr. Kundry, it's a real pleasure, and thank you everybody who's tuning in for this uh, brainy conversation. All right. So, I know everybody knows you, but there might be one human being listening who is not familiar, familiar with you or your work. Tell me a little about, bit about your story. I really enjoyed reading about it. How did you become so obsessed with optimized learning? Well, my inspiration really was my desperation. When people see me on stages do these memory feats where I'll um, memorize 50 people's names in an audience or 100 numbers or 100 words randomly, get selected in an audience, forwards and backwards. I always tell people I don't do this to impress you. I do this more to express to you what's possible because the truth is every single person who's listening could do that and even more. And I know that's a very big claim. Uh, yet uh, we, we just weren't taught how to do that. School is a wonderful place to learn what to learn, uh, math, history, science, Spanish, but there weren't a lot of classes on how to learn those things, how to focus, how to remember. And um, and I know this is possible because my, my mess became my message. I grew up with some severe learning challenges. When I was five years old in kindergarten, I had a very bad fall in class. I was rushed to the emergency room. Uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, I since I had actually three of them before the age of 12. I had um, very slow processing issues. Uh, teachers would repeat themselves numerous times. I would pretend to understand, but I didn't really understand. Um, yeah, and after my accident, my parents said I was not quite the same. Whereas before, I was very energized and very curious, uh, playful. I became very shut down. I had poor focus, poor memory. It took me an extra few years just to learn how to read. I remember a defining moment when I was nine years old. I was really struggling in class, holding uh, the, the rest of the students back, didn't understand the lessons, and I was being teased for it, you know, almost borderline bullied. And a teacher came to my defense and uh, said, that's the boy with the broken brain. I think she had good intentions, meaning I had some challenges that she was pointing out, but all I remembered was that phrase, broken brain. and. You know, adults have to be very careful with their external words because they become a student's internal words. So every single time I did badly on a, an exam, which was all the time, every time I wasn't picked for sports, which was all the time, I would always say, oh, it's because I had the broken brain. So that label became my limit and I struggled all through school, elementary school, middle school, junior high and high school. And eventually around age 18, I hit a wall. I just couldn't work any harder and I ended up being hospitalized because I was just living in the library and passed out and I fell down a flight of stairs, hit my head again and I just thought I I thought I died. I was wasting away and, and I just started to put my mind towards another way. And I started to study this idea of meta learning, learning how to learn. I started studying ancient mnemonics, memory um, tools and techniques, uh, speed reading. I want to understand how the brain works so I could work my brain better. I want to understand how my memory works so I could work my memory better. I started studying uh, adult learning theory, multiple intelligence theory, Howard Gardner's work out of Harvard, and these different things. And, and about 60 days into it, 
I hit a, a tipping point where a light switch flipped on and I started to, to really understand things for the first time in my life. I started to have this deep level of concentration, uh, this ability to recall and um, process information better and my grades shot up, but also my life just shot up also. And, um, and because I couldn't help but help other people because I didn't want other people to struggle the way I did. I remember I got to work with a tutor, a, a young uh, student. She was a freshman in college, and she read 30 books in 30 days. And I wanted to find out not how. I, I taught her how to read and understand those books, but I wanted to know why. And I found out her mother was actually diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was only given a couple of months to live. And the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life, and books on health and wellness and diet and um and she ended up doing so. And, and when I found that out, you know, months later, it, it just it ignited a spark in me. I, I realized that if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. And it's a superpower we all have inside of us. It's just uh, we weren't necessarily shown how. And so I dedicated my life. This was over 28 years ago, every single day since then, to help people to unlock the genius that they have inside of them, to show people how to have a better brain so they could have a brighter life. So let's go back for a second. So you're spending 60 days deciphering all this wisdom, if you will, mm -hmm. and then something, something clicked. Mm -hmm. what, what clicked? Uh, you're a, you're a, you got a bad brain. You're a slow learner. Yeah. Um, what, you know, what clicked in those 60 days that was the aha moment for you? You know, it, it I, there was a, there was a moment in um, in class that I recall I was in a, in a lecture center and um, back then they had overhead projectors right <laughs> not the fancy equipment that are in classrooms right now and where, where teachers and professors would draw you know markers on there and they they put up something in the lecture center and and just as a backstory my my two biggest challenges growing up were learning and my superpower really was being invisible because I had these challenges with learning, I would always find a way to sit behind the tall kid in class or sit all the way in the back and really shrink. And uh, my superpower was being invisible because when you don't have the answers, you don't want to be called on. You don't want to give a book report. You don't want the spotlight. And, um, and my, which is interesting because my two biggest challenges were learning and public speaking. So the universe has a sense of humor because that's, that's what I do for a living is public speak on this thing called learning. Um, but in class, uh, you know, in an auditorium lecture center full of hundreds of people, I was very, you know, sit in the back and very, very quiet and never raised my hand. Um, but they put on something on the overhead and, um, you know, I, I, I started laughing <laughs> out loud and I would never do that. I would never emote. I, I was very uh, introverted, but beyond introverted, I was very shy. Um, and I started laughing and everyone turned around to look at me. And uh, I became self-conscious because it was a, just a, a knee-jerk reaction. And then about 10 or 15 seconds into it, other people started to laugh. And there was this wave of laughter uh, because of what was on the, well, what I had read on the overhead faster than other people in the class. And, uh, and that, that's where I realized that, uh, that things were clicking. But it was in, it, over those 60 days, I was learning studying technique note-taking techniques like um, you know memory tools to be able to so it wasn't it was a gradual change but i shifted my focus you know i found out that school is a wonderful place to learn what to learn math history science spanish but there weren't a lot of classes on how to learn those things how to focus how how to study it how to read it better how to uh, how to critically think how to how to remember you know, I, they teach you three R's in school, writing, reading, arithmetic, spelling, obviously, is not one of those R's. But well, what about remembering? What about retention? What about recall? Socrates said learning is remembering. And, um, and so I started studying those things. And because I wasn't getting making much progress with my traditional studies, but I after I sharpened the saw and learned how to learn, then I went back to my studies and it, it was a totally different experience. And I think the big gap in school, and it's not a slight against teachers. I, teachers are some of the most committed, compassionate, caring uh, individuals out there. They're maybe not compensated as, as well as they maybe should be. Um, my mother became a school teacher to help me with my learning difficulties. It's just the system hasn't changed, much like a lot of systems haven't evolved as much. 
you know, we live in an age of autonomous electric cars. We have rockets that are going to Mars. But sometimes when it comes to traditional education, it's more like a horse and carriage, and it hasn't advanced as much as, as the world has advanced. And so my mission is to be able to fill in those gaps. I feel like more people upgrade their phones and their apps on their phones than they do the most important technology, which is their mind. And so I wrote Limitless as an owner's manual for our, for our brain to be able to learn and, and be able to, to accomplish the things that are important to us. Okay, so in the book, you talk about having a better brain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, come on, how, how, do, how do I get one? I, okay, <laughs> oh, I, okay, I just got it. Uh, help me through that. What, what the heck, how do you get a better brain? So, I mean, part of it is the this, this software. So I teach people in the, the half of the book is on methodology, how to read faster, how to remember names, how to be able to focus and concentrate, do those things. But then also it's, it's the hardware, taking care of the hardware. And so, you know, when I do lectures at places like the, the Cleveland Clinic um, or institutions working with doctors or, or caregivers or researchers or, or, or patients themselves, we find that uh, we could have a, a considerable impact that certain things aren't fixed, like our memory is not fixed like our shoe size. And in the book, I kind of dissolve some of the, the prominent lies, if, if you will, when it comes to learning. And a lie for me stands for a limited idea entertained. That gene, Like one of those lies would be that genius is born when I, I make a case that genius is actually built. That if somebody is extraordinary in a certain area, it comes through training, it could come through discipline and effort and using the right strategies. And part of that is just maintaining optimal you know, brain health. And so things that we focus on and that we talk about in the book about how to have a better brain, things that are just common sense but not often common practice, things like a good brain diet. You know, eating the, those 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 foods that that are good for your brain, because I do believe we are what we eat, and you write a lot about this, you know, in in depth, and the, the foods that are that are harmful also as well to to our brain. Um, things like also optimizing our sleep. We know, especially for our brains, it's it if people have long term memory issues. I would, I would check your sleep because I, I didn't realize this until 10 years ago when I had my first sleep study, but I was, I was averaging only a couple hours of sleep a night. And about 10 years ago, after an overnight sleep study in a clinic, I, I was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea, where I, was, I stopped breathing over 200 and almost 20 times a night, and each episode was more than 10 seconds. And the doctor at UCLA was saying, like, no wonder you're not sleeping. It's like somebody coming in every night with putting a pillow over your face 200 times. And I had this obstructive apnea. And so um, so sleep, though, could uh, can interfere with your long-term memory when we're consolidating short to long-term memory. It could have an effect on, uh, you know, when you're sleeping, you could... Uh, potentially clean out the beta amyloid plaque that could lead to brain aging challenges. It's I'm very passionate about that because I, I lost my grandmother when I was going through my broken brain phase in elementary school. I lost my uh, grandmother to Alzheimer's, and so we're donating actually 100% of the proceeds of the book to build schools for children in need, uh, for for schools, uh, teachers, school books, healthcare, clean water and also um, Alzheimer's research, especially women's um, Alzheimer's because of, in, in memory of my grandmother, where, where females are, are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's as, as men. And so, um, but going back to, uh, to sleep, um, that's kind of like when the sewage system kind of kicks in when we're sleeping, and also dreaming also. Um, getting good sleep is important for dreaming, meaning that uh, we find that it's a myth that your brain shuts off at night. In some ways, it's more active. And what is it doing? It's not only consolidating short to long term memory and integrating, but it's, you know, it's, it's through, we'll probably spend about 20 years of our life sleeping, maybe three to five years dreaming. And uh, some people might know this, but amazing inventions and works of art and, uh, and literature came from dream states. Mary Shelley came up with Frankenstein in her dream. Uh, Paul McCartney came up with the song Yesterday in His Dream. Uh, a chemist came up with the framework of the periodic table in his, in his dream. And so what are we dreaming about? So I have processes for remembering our dreams and doing those things. But um, good brain diet, 
uh, sleep stress management. We know that chronic stress uh, has the potential of actually shrinking our brains. When, and and not, not only that, but the chronic fear that's going on with everything in the world, chronic fear actually makes us more susceptible and compromises our immune system, susceptible to colds, to flus, to, to viruses, whole area of science, psycho neuroimmunology. And I think it's very important for people to stay in guard to their what's going in their brain, in their mind, because there's an algorithm, just like there's an algorithm to social media. If you engage with all, if you're going on Instagram and engaging with all the cat posts, watching all the cat videos, commenting all the cat videos, sharing all the cat videos, then Instagram shows you a whole lot more cats, right? And you feel like your whole feed is cats because it's giving you what you're engaging with. I find that metaphor that metaphor is same with our mind, that our mind has an algorithm. And if we're always just focusing on what's dark and scary and threatening, which, you know, our minds are being hijacked by the media, you know, because you have to, as a hunt, yeah, as a survival mechanism, pay attention to what could be threatening to you. But if people are overindulging in what's dark, primarily our brains are deletion devices, meaning that at any given time, we could be paying attention to a billion stimuli and we can't let all that in. We would go, we would go, it'd be way too much overload. So primarily we're deleting and generalizing, keeping information out. And what do we let in is the things that we're engaging with, that part of our reticular activating system, we're activating our focus on the things that we care about. And if we just start engaging with all that darkness, then just like that algorithm with cats, we just start seeing more of that darkness. The challenge is we have a finite conscious mind. Um, according to George Miller at Harvard, um, seven plus or minus two bits of conscious information. And if you're paying attention to all that's threatening, then you don't have bandwidth to pay attention to opportunity, to gratitude, which you can be grateful to, to possibility. And um, so control that input and have stress management coping tools, you know, whether it's meditation, whether whatever people subscribe to. And so those are just a handful of things. We talk about brain nutrients um, because, you know, the brain has, while it's 2% of our body mass, it requires approximately 20% of the, of the nutrients. Um, and there's an area of, of study I mentioned in the book called about neuronutrition. Uh, potentially the brain has different, uh, slightly different requirements than the rest of the body. And so are we supplementing and things like uh, omega-3s, DHA? Um, we talk about clean environment and how that's important to your brain, whether it's the quality of the air, uh, whether it also the brain loves a clean environment. We know this when we make our bed or we clean our desk off or we clean off the screen and put everything in file folders. Our external world is a reflection of our internal world. And uh, we may remind her to Marie Kondo our minds. Um, what also affects our brains are, are the people we spend time with. You know, there's this phrase that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And when you study the nervous system, we have these things called mirror neurons where it creates empathy, where we imitate our surroundings and we start adapting to and adopting the attitudes, the language patterns, the habits of the people around us. So it's not just our biological networks and our neurological networks. It has a lot to do with our social networks in terms of what they're eating. If, you know, if our friend's friend is smoking, it's going to have a greater influence on us also as well. <clears throat> also protecting our brain. If you want your better brain, you know, having to had a number of head traumas protect your brain and avoid those extreme sports. I, I wish I was better supervised when I was a child, but wear a helmet. Um, another thing that's great for our brain is new learnings. You know, we've discovered so much about the human brain in the past couple of decades, more than the previous, you know, couple of centuries. You know, when we're, when we're looking at things like neuroplasticity, one of the ways that the brain loves novelty, it helps us create new connections. Just like if you want to build a muscle, you give it novelty and nutrition. Well, same thing with your mental muscles. You stimulate it with new ideas. It makes new connections. You feed it the right nutrition. You give it the right rest. And so I guess what I do is kind of like a personal trainer would make your physical muscles stronger, more energized, more pliable, more flexible. I want people's mental muscles, their focus, their memory, and so on to be stronger, to be more energized, more, more agile and flexible. So in the book, you talk about the three M's. Yes. Uh, um, 
Help me with the three M's. Oh, I love this. This is really the heart of the book. Um, the last M is are the methodologies. And it's interesting. I mean, you've gone through this process repeatedly. This is my first book in uh, 28 years of, of teaching. And when I first wrote it, the first draft, it was 100% on the last M, which are methods. It was a purely a self-help book on how to do these things, how to read faster, how to remember what you read, how to give a TED talk, you know, from from recall, how to critically think and all these, how to focus. And before I hit send to my publisher, I asked myself this question because I was nervous about it. I was like, this is, I've waited three decades to put this out there. And I said, will 100% of the people who read, who read this book, who read this book, get results? And my honest answer was no. And that was kind of like a coming to, uh, you know, looking in the mirror and just be, be honest with myself. I was like, no, because a lot of people know what to do. They, they know the methods, but they don't do what they know. And I realized that I had to incorporate the, the successes I've had over the past three decades, you know, with programs in over 195 countries and, and our own podcast with tens of millions of downloads, I get this feedback that it's not just methodology. There's two M's that have to come before that. And there are these three M's and I call it the limitless model. So to make this interactive, we can make actually this a, a masterclass for everyone who's listening. I want everyone who's listening to think about one area, just one specific area where you feel like you're held back, where you feel limited. Maybe it is in a relationship. Maybe it's in your personal health and well-being. Maybe it's in your income. Maybe it's in your impact. Maybe you feel limited in your learning. You just use your memory or you, you, just, you just you feel like you're slow in some area and you're not making progress. Because Limitless is not about being perfect. Limitless, I wrote it, to help people progress and advance beyond what they believe is possible. And so it starts with the limitless model, because if you feel like you're in a box in some area, and I think most people could identify with an area of their life where it's not their desired state, that box is three dimensional, right, by definition. And the three dimensions that keep us stuck in that box for making progress are the same three forces that will liberate you. And how I want people to imagine it is three intersecting circles. So they call it a Venn diagram. It kind of looks like Mickey Mouse, two ears that cross over and a face. So three intersecting circles. And these are the three M's. The last M, as I mentioned, are the methods. But if you could have the methods and still be stuck in that box and what's missing, the first M is your mindset. And your mindset I am defining as your set of assumptions and attitudes about something, your attitudes and assumptions about the world and how it works, your attitudes, assumptions about health and wellness, your attitudes, assumptions about dieting, your attitudes, assumption about, about education, about business, attitudes, assumptions about yourself. What would fall in this circle would be things like what you believe is possible. Another thing that would fall in the circle is what you believe you're capable of. So you might think it's possible for somebody else to be super healthy or to reverse this condition, but you might believe you're not capable of it. Um, and that will keep you in that box. Another thing that would fall in there is what you believe you deserve. And so I could teach somebody a method on how to remember names, a common issue for a lot of people, how three steps on how to remember everyone's name. But if their mindset is I'm not smart enough or I have a horrible memory, they're still going to be stuck in that box because all behavior is belief driven. And people come to me all the time and they say, Jim, I'm just getting too old. I'm not smart enough. And I say, stop. If you fight for your limits, you get to keep them. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. And we always have to monitor our self-talk because our brains are like supercomputers and our self-talk is the program it will run. So if you tell yourself you're not good at remembering people's names, you won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. So that's our mindset. Now, the second M, you could have a limitless mindset and believe everything is possible. You're capable of it. You even deserve to be healthy or you deserve to make that money or you deserve to have a great memory. And you could have the methods, but you could still be stuck in that box because you lack the motivation. And that's the second M is motivation. Now, with motivation, it's, it's kind of a loaded word and words have um, effects on how we process information. And some people think motivation is just about getting hyped up and pumping yourself up or maybe exerting willpower to be motivated to eat that right diet or to exercise that day or to prioritize your sleep. 
But for most people, motivation is the equivalent of a warm bath that just cools down, right? And I discovered after three decades of teaching this, not only is it based on the latest neuroscience towards accelerated learning and cognitive performance, it's just me working with everyone from children with severe learning challenges like I had to seniors that are very concerned about uh, you know, these senior moments and, and, and early stage brain aging challenges and everyone in between that I believe that genius leaves clues. And the people that are have sustainable motivation, there, there are three elements in common. And let, let's do this thought experiment, everybody. Think about, let's say we're going to build the ultimate motivated human being. What are the three things that are necessary? The formula for sustained motivation, limitless motivation is this. P times E times S3. P times E times S3. And what do these things mean? The first thing that person needs, let's say it is to exercise, right? It's pretty conclusive that, you know, we have, we have brains to be able to control our movement primarily. And as your body moves, your brain grooves. The challenge is we live very sedentary lives. We're behind screens all the time nowadays. And so moving is great. We create, when we move, we create brain derived neurotropic factors. It's BDNF, it's like fertilizer for our brain. Yet people aren't doing the exercise. And I'm not talking about doing soul cycle three times a week. I'm talking about just moving each day, going for a hike, going for a walk. And, uh, and even there are studies that show that people, when they're doing something rhythmic, like an elliptical or a light walk, and they're listening to your audio book or podcast, then they're actually assimilating it and retaining it actually better. So, you know, as you move, what's good for your heart is going to be generally good for your head, more blood flow, more oxygen. And yet not everybody does that. So they're not motivated. So the P stands for purpose. And I would re remind everybody, purpose is not just intellectually knowing the reasons why to do stuff. A lot of people can name all the reasons why they should eat well or prioritize sleep or meditate or exercise, but they don't feel the benefits, right? Or they don't feel the consequences of not doing so. So for example, and I, there might be a little bit of background noise. I'm cocooning in New York City, and this is a, an opportunity for people to build and flex their focus muscles right now as a mental exercise. And so it's very real and it's very raw. I remember I have an acquaintance that just was not healthy. They did everything opposite of what you would recommend somebody uh, do to be healthy and well. And he ends up having a heart attack, almost dies, has triple bypass surgery, very, very painful for him and, and the people around him. But even afterwards, he still didn't change his lifestyle, you know, much to the dismay of his family and his friends, you know, giving him suggestions. And then years later, I see him on the street and he is like the picture perfect of health. He just looks years younger. And I just had to know, I was like, I know what he did, right? He was explaining to me all these things. I, I want to know why, you know, just like this young, you know, one woman that read 30 books in 30 days, her, she found purpose in her mom, right? Well, he one day comes home to his daughter who's crying and crying uncontrollably. And she ended, she had this dream that she lost her dad and she wasn't, he wasn't there to walk her down the aisle and see her children, this whole story, right? But that was purpose and all of a sudden, the lifestyle just fell into place because he found you know, a purpose that he felt. That success really goes from your head to your heart to your hands, three H's. But you could visualize a goal in your head but not act with your hands, i.e. you procrastinate. And a lot of times you're not allowing yourself to, to have the second H, which is the feelings, the heart. Because we are not, as much as we like to think we are, we are not logical, right? We are biological. And you think about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphin, we are these feeling soups. And if you don't feel something, we're not going to do those things. And so even remembering someone's name, a lot of people won't remember names simply because they don't have a purpose for it. Or the names they will remember, they do have a purpose. They have feelings. They, have, they are attracted to the person. Or they could be good for their business, right? So the key to a long-term memory is this. Information by itself is forgettable but information combined with emotion becomes unforgettable, right? So we don't remember the periodic table of most people back in high school because the state that they learned it in was that of boredom. And if information times emotion is a long-term memory and the boredom is on a scale of zero to 10, zero, anything times zero is zero. But we remember things like, I bet that people listening, that there's a song that could take you back to when you're in high school 
or a fragrance or a food that they can take it back to when you're a child because you, that's where you take something that's ordinary and make it extraordinary using using those feelings. And so going back, Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. That's why I think remembering names is so important. But going back to this equation in terms of motivation, feelings, we are feeling creatures. First thing in order to be motivated, tap into that feeling of what the benefits that will come from doing this activity or the consequences that you'll pay for not doing it. And if you don't feel it, you won't sustain that motivation. Now, the second part of that I said was that we're building this ultimate motivated human being. If someone just has a big enough purpose, will they always be motivated? And I said to myself, no, they could be missing the E in the equation, P times E times S3. The E stands for energy. Because somebody going back to working out, you know, it's universal. We know that's that, that exercise and movement is good for people. And yet you could have the purpose, but maybe you have a newborn child and you haven't slept in three days and you're just exhausted. You're not going to be very motivated to follow through and be and exercise because the evidence that somebody is motivated is not what you say. It's not how you feel. It's not how your employees say they're motivated. It's not how your children say they feel. It's if they're doing the thing consistently, motive for action. There's action that's there. Or let's say people want to read. I think that leaders are readers. When people do see me on Instagram and Facebook photos with, you know, Bill Gates and, and Oprah Winfrey and Elon Musk, we bonded over books, right? And I think it's so amazing that if someone like yourself has decades of experience and you put it into a book, I happen to have one of your books right here. <laughs> oh, bless your heart, The Longevity Paradox, he's holding up. Yes, um, but if you, you, know, you have decades of experience and you put it into a book and one of your listeners could read that book in a handful of days, they could download decades into days. That's a biggest advantage people have. So it actually takes about 45 minutes a day for the average reader to finish one book a week. 52 books a year, where the average person only reads two or three or four books a year. Imagine reading 52 books a year. And uh, because the, there's 64,000 words in the average book, and the average person reads about 200 words per minute. That means it takes about 320 minutes to get through a book, divided by seven days in a week, about 45 minutes a day. But if somebody can't read you know, 45 minutes a day, maybe it's because they ate a big meal full of just processed, you know, it's just junk food, and that's not the junk and food don't really go together. So just junk and there's food, but they eat this, this meal and they're in food coma and they're not going to study, you know, they're not going to be motivated to read that day because they lack the energy. And so that's why energy is so important. Um, that's why in the book we talk about sleep and, and other things like energy vampires, mitigating stress, which takes a lot of energy. And then my mind said, okay, if somebody just has purpose, they feel it and they have limitless energy will they always follow through and be motivated? And I said, no, one more exception. If they're missing S3, three S's, small, simple steps. Often I find with working with clients, especially high achievers, they have a purpose of building this big vision, but it's so big, it's intimidating. And something that's confusing, people don't know what to do. And a confused mind, whether it's your patients or your potential customers, they don't do anything. And so often what you need to do is break it down into small, simple steps. So as an example, maybe for someone who doesn't work out regularly, an hour a day of exercise is just too much. It's too intimidating. A small, simple step is putting on your running shoes. Maybe reading 45 minutes a day for somebody who doesn't read 45 minutes in a month is too intimidating. Maybe a small, simple step is opening up the book or reading one line, right? And so how do you find your small, simple step? Simple question. What is the tiniest action you could take that will give you progress towards this goal where you can't fail? What is the tiniest action you could take right now to give you progress towards this goal where you can't fail? Because it requires very little energy and very little effort. So that's my formula, my limitless formula for motivation, purpose, energy, and small, simple steps. And then finally, you have mindset, motivation. The third M, as we mentioned, are the methods. Now, here's the aha for a lot of people. The methods are speed reading focus, but it could be methods for being healthy, methods for marketing. You have to upgrade those methods for our current time, our current based on the current research. And here's the thing. When you're looking at this Venn diagram, there are three M's, but there are also three I's. And the three I's are the intersecting points of these M's, where mindset and motivation cross over. That shared space is inspiration. 
Now you have mindset experts, you have mindset books, a great book by Dr. Carol Dweck called Mindset. You have motivational speakers, motivational books, where they cross over, you have inspiration and you have inspiring speakers, inspiring books, inspiring movies. What does an inspiring movie do? It changes your mindset of what's possible and it gives you some energy and some drive, but you're inspired, but you lack the methods. You don't know what to do. So an inspiring speaker will inspire you, but like, what, what, what do I eat now? Or how do I move? Or how do I do my sleep? They want to be there with the methods. Now, the second I is where mindset and methods cross over, where mindset you believe everything is possible in your mind and methods, you know exactly what to do based on the latest research, the processes, that shared space is ideation, ideation, because it just stays an idea because what's missing, the motivation to do anything. So you're still stuck in that box. And then finally, where motivation and methods cross over, you have implementation. Somebody is motivated. They have purpose. They feel it. They have limitless energy. They they broke things down to small, simple steps. They know the actual full strategy and processes to be well um, and or to to learn faster or to build their business. But they could still be stuck in that box while they're implementing because they're only going to be able to achieve what their mindset allows them to, what they believe is possible, but that they believe they're capable of, or even what they believe they deserve. Maybe they don't think they, they, they deserve to be healthy or deserve to be in that relationship. And so the fourth I, where all three I's and all three M's converge right in the middle, the fourth I is integration. Integration, like integer or integral, means you're whole. And that's just who you are, and that's the limitless state. And I create this framework for accelerated learning, but it really it's a framework, a lens for human potential, because it takes the, the angst out of the judgment, where if you feel like you're not making progress and you beat yourself up, studies done on self-compassion show that when you beat yourself up, you're less likely to actually follow through. But when you're kind to yourself, you're more likely to follow through where you say, okay, I'm only human. I'm doing the best I can. You know, we're living in a, in a very chaotic world right now. And give your, you add kindness to it, you're more likely to follow through. But going into this, now you have a lens to look at saying, where where's my bottleneck here? Is it in my mindset? Do I not believe I'm, 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 I'm worthy of this or it's possible for me or I'm capable of it? Or do I not feel purpose? Or do I need to spend some time on my energy? Or do I need to break, this is overwhelming. Do I need to break it down into small, simple steps? Or do I need to listen to a podcast or read a book on the best methods for being healthy or the best methods for learning or the best methods for investing? And so that's why I created this framework to be an explanatory schema for why we get stuck. And also, because then you could pinpoint the area that, that it limits you because Limitless is about redrawing the borders and boundaries of really what's possible. Let me, I tell you what, let, let's, do, let's do a fun thing for everybody who's listening. Okay, uh, I can't learn a foreign language. Mm -hmm. Boy, have I tried, I am horrible at it. I spend a lot of time normally uh, traveling to foreign countries and do interact with lots of people, would love to speak fluent French like my wife, would love to speak fluent Italian. Uh, I've, you know, I've gotten the books on tape, I listen to it in the car, and, you know, and then I go to put it into practice, and you know, it's just an unmitigated disaster. Now, part of my excuse is I've, been, you know, I've told myself from day one I can't learn a foreign language. And, so, and my wife speaks fluent French, and so every time we're in France, I may start speaking, and of course, fracture it and the you know, waiter glares at you and my wife says, hey, <laughs> shut up, I'll, I'll take over. And okay, help, help me out. All the listeners want to know, how am I going to learn French? Right, right, right. And so language is, is interesting because the largest chapter in the book is the chapter on memory. I, I wrote it in, uh, in Greece. I found out that the, the again, the, the, the goddess of memory, her children were the nine muses of art, literature, and, and science. And so we know the power of that. And uh, so if someone wants to learn another language, there are a number of methods that you could use outside of just rote repetition, because that's how most people study. The, you know, in medical school or whatever people made their focus, they would just do rote repetition and force that information and in, repeat it over and over again. And in, in physics, um, just like there are these vi variables, frequency, duration, and intensity. And think about that for working out your body. 
you could go to the gym many times frequently or do many reps frequency or intent or you could do duration you could spend more time in that in that workout you know zumba class or more time in that pilates class or more time on that treadmill or you could do something so intense that you get results also same thing with marketing it could be frequency of sales calls frequency of ads or longer duration ads or something so intense it creates a change and so same thing with our our memories and when it comes to memory Memory is often, I, I teach people in the book that memory is as easy as pie, P-I-E. And these are the three elements I focus on when you want to enhance your memory. And the P stands for place, where we realize that the ancient Greeks, because I didn't just want to study the latest neuroscience applied to memory, I wanted to know what ancient cultures did before there were printing presses. And I found out that uh, Simonides, an ancient uh, he, a poet and order, he gave a talk and afterwards he left the building, something tragic happened, the building collapsed and he was the only lone survivor. And because he was a lone survivor, he had the responsibility of helping family members identify their loved ones. And he was able to because he remembered where they were all sitting. And it's kind of human nature as a hunter gatherer, we didn't need to memorize hundred digit numbers. We need to remember where things were. Where's the, where's the fertile soil? Where's the clean water? Where's the enemy tribe? Where's the food? And that was our survival. So P is the place where we store information. The I in Pi stands for imagine. And we remember things better that we could visualize in our mind. We are better, often people are better with faces than they are with names. You go to somebody and say, I recognize, I remember your face, but I forgot your name. You never go to someone and say the opposite. You never go to someone and say, I remember your name, but I forgot your face. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. True, that's very true. Yeah. But there's a proverb that says, what I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I understand. I, saw, I, I heard the name, I forgot the name. I saw the face, I remember the face. And what I do, going back to practice, I understand because practice makes progress. So visualizing helps you to remember. So that's the I, you imagine it. And the E in pi stands for entwine. Entwine, what does that mean? It means you put or associate two things together because ultimately all learning is that. All learning is associating something you don't know to something you know. So you're associating a name to a face or a word to its definition, or a foreign, or for a foreign language to its, its translation, or a capital to its you know, country. There's always two bits of information that you're associating. In this case, what you're entwining is the place and the image. And that's a simple formula for remembering faces, you know, names and faces, and even languages. Let me give you an example. All right, so when we're talking about languages, the key, one of the keys is, is, is beyond repetition and frequency is go for intensity. As you could see it and you could feel it and hear it, the more of your nervous system you use, the more intense it becomes, the more unforgettable it is. As an example, actually, let's, let, let's, let's do this. Okay, this, is, this will be interesting. I want people who are listening to do what um, I'm, I'm explaining right now. Um, we'll uh, take, um, I'll give a couple of French examples, but let's, let's learn how to count to 10 in Japanese. All right, in two minutes. That's the promise. Two minutes. Whoa. All right. Count to ten in Japanese. And most people say, oh, just repetition. Ichi ni san shi go roku sichi hachi kuju and just repeat it a hundred times till your mind gets bored and, and just gives up. Well, here if we could see if there's a place and there's an image and we're we're associating it, we're gonna remember it better. So um, maybe you could do this with me and uh, and just play along if you're listening or if you're watching this. So one and two is ichi ni. So itch your knee right now. Scratch your knee. Uh, itchy knee. Itchy knee. Got That's it. That's one itchy knee. and two. Itchy knee. Three is san. San. It sounds to me like sun. So point to the light or san and say san. San. And four. San. Four is she. She. So point to a female. <laughs> a female or a photo of female. Good. She. So that's okay. one through four. Itchy. Ichi, ni, sun, she, she, five and almost said female. Exactly. <laughs> but your true memory knows the difference, right? So five is go, go, like you're going. So I'm just moving my arms and my legs as if I'm going for a walk. So go. So what's five? Go. 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 Six is roku, roku. And for me, it reminds me if I could visualize rowing a canoe. So imagine this, just kind of rowing a canoe. So again, ichi, ni, ni san, san, shi, shi, and then you go, 
Oh. Roku. Roku. And that's one through six. And then if you keep on going, seven is actually Shichi, and it sounds like I'm sitting, Shichi. And then eight is ha Hachi, and it's a Hatsi. So you're Shichi, and then you stand up Hachi. And finally, nine is Ku. Ku. What, what Ku's? Like a baby. So you just move your arms around like you're holding a baby, ku, and then 10 is ju, like a jewel, like you're putting on a ring, a jewel, all right, jewel. And that, that's a simple way in two minutes to explain it, but what we're doing again is we're placing it, we're imagining it, and we're entwining it. An example of taking something like, um, like a foreign language, if you wanted to say, like real basic for people listening that don't speak French, if you wanted to say something like thank you in French, right? We know that it is merci. And now here's the thing. For people, most times we'll do a flashcard, right? They'll have the word and its translation on the other side. But if you use your imagination, sound it out like you're playing Pictionary, merci, like a mare seeing. What's a mare? A female horse. And seeing maybe has glasses on. Or maybe the mare is in the sea and you're helping the mare out of the sea, the water, and then he says, or she says, thank you. Or you're putting the glasses back on the mare, mare C, and she says, thank you. And people will say, that's so childish. But who are the fastest learners? They're children and they're so children. playful. They use their creativity, they use their imagination. When I say limitless, the limitless resource we have on planet Earth is human potential. It's not the sky's the limit. Our mind is the limit. There's no limit to our creativity. There's no limit to our imagination. There's no limit to our ability to solve problems. And the reason why I bring these exercises up is in a world where jobs are going to machines, they're being automated, they are going to artificial intelligence, what's not going to be as easily outsourced to a device are what makes us human our creativity, our imagination, things like strategy. So what we're doing is we're actually building and flexing, we're working out those muscles, those creativity muscles, those imagination muscles, these strategy muscles. Take something like, how do you say something like, how do you say please instead of thank you? How do you say please? You know, you know, <laughs> in French. Oh, in French, hang, actually I was, I was thinking of a joke, so now I'm, now I'm completely off. <laughs> so if somebody says like, s'il vous plaît, for me, yeah. it's like, what does it sound like if we're playing Pictionary? Silver plate. So imagine you're, you build in please into a story, you're entwining it with a silver plate. And, and your true memory knows the difference, you just need a prompt to remind you, right? And then once, you see what people really need, especially with names, they need something to overcome what I call the six second syndrome. Somebody tells you their name and you have six seconds to do something with it, otherwise it's gone. You know, and so when you pick a place on their face, like they're, they're, they have great head of hair, great pair of glasses, and you find out, you know, that's the place, P and Pi, and the I is imagine. Maybe their name is David. And for me, I imagine a slingshot. Why? Because David and Goliath. And the E is entwine. And so what am I entwining? Their glasses with the slingshot. And I'm just imagining myself hitting them in the glasses with the slingshot. It's so ludicrous, would never, ever happened in reality, but I'll never forget it. Because when I say goodbye to him 20 minutes later, what's his place? Oh, his glasses. What was I doing? Hitting with a slingshot. What's his name? David. And here's the thing, even when it doesn't work, it still works. Because it gets you to focus on the person and it gets you to focus on the name, right? And then even when, so even when it doesn't work, it still works. And when I know the person's name is David long-term, then the picture disappears, just like the silver plate disappears or the mare with the glasses. How do you ask, how are you in French? So, so if you want to say something like, uh, uh, let's say, como allez-vous? Yeah. So for me, como allez-vous sounds like, come on to this alley, see this view. So I might imagine myself in France, I see the Eiffel Tower, and then I'm going, I'm having a conversation with some meeting someone, I'm asking them how they are. And then all of a sudden they say, come on to this alley, see this view. Because if you did the work and you studied it, you know it's como allez-vous, but you need something to prompt you, just like that David and Goliath image. And then once you know what it is, your true memory, because what it does, it makes it so intense, you don't have to do the frequency and the duration. Now change it and you want to learn it in Chinese. Take out the Eiffel Tower, put in the Great Wall of China. And you have, you know, how are you? And it's Nihoma, 
Niho ma, and I just think of like going up and saying, how are you? And somebody takes a garden, someone's ma takes a garden hoe and then just hits me on the knee. And it sounds so silly and ludicrous, but remember, information combined with emotion, humor, violence becomes more memorable. And other ways we talk about in the book on how to do this, on how to study, we talk about the best music to have in the background, certain Baroque classical music, Vivaldi, Handal, uh, harmonizes with the resting heartbeat, uh, which helps you go into this alpha state, uh, brainwave state, to help you uh, learn content better, facts, figures, foreign languages. We talk about space review and retention, all different kinds of strategies to stack onto it to make learning not only fast, but enjoyable. Oh, but come on, Jim, I can just pull up my app on my iPhone and translate everything. I, I don't need your tricks. Come on. And here's the thing, Stephen, because I, I get this comment a lot. I train at Google and Facebook and they're like, Jim, I don't have to remember this. I have a search engine. We organize the world's information. Here, here's my answer for this. I'll give you a couple of answers. Number one, our life in the book, I have a quote from a French philosopher that says life is the C between B and D. B is birth. D is death, C is choice. And we always can make these, these choices. And part of the things is our life is a reflection of all the choices we've made up to this point of our, of our existence, right? What are we gonna eat? Where are we gonna live? Who are we gonna spend time with? What are we gonna do for a living? All these things, right? But we can only make good decisions based on the information we know. And that presupposes we remember it. And so that's why memory is so important. But the other reason why, it's not just about mental intelligence, it's about mental fitness. There's these, you know, things that are happening like digital dementia, where we're outsourcing our memories to our smart devices and it keeps our to-dos, it keeps our calendars, it keeps our phone. How many phone numbers did you know growing up? How many? Like a lot. All of them. Yeah, a lot. How many phone numbers do you know or whoever's listening? How many phone numbers do you know right now? One, two, three, maybe. And there could be somebody you text and call every day, but you, if your battery is dead, you don't have your phone with you, you honestly don't know who the, what their number is. And not that I want to memorize 200 numbers, right? I mean, I certainly could teach somebody how to do that, but we've lost the ability. It should be concerning we've lost the ability to remember one or a PIN number or a passcode or a conversation we just had or something we were going to say or why we went to the store. We go to the store to buy one thing. We come back with two bags full of things, except for that one thing that we want, you know, the absent mind after someone's name. And that's why I believe memory is a muscle. Yeah, there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's a trained memory and an untrained memory. And this also goes to not only digital dementia, um, but also what I talk about in the book, digital deduction, where if you don't have to think anymore, and then there's a technology that tells you where and when to turn, right? Or what's recommended for you, because there's an algorithm. We're finding children, they don't, when they're tested, they don't have the same analytical ability of previous generations because the technology is doing all the thinking for them. So they don't have to develop these kinds uh, thinking, uh, fitness, like the critical thinking, divergent thinking, rationalization, and, and so on. So technology is wonderful. It allows us to have this conversation right now and everyone to listen for it. But technology is a tool for you, for you to use. But your brain is like a muscle. It's obviously not a muscle, but it, it acts like a muscle. But if I use a technology like Lyft or Uber to go five blocks when I could have walked, or I use an elevator when I could have walked up three blocks of you know flights of stairs, there is a physical toll to my body. And if I put my arm in a sling for 12 months, it wouldn't stay the same. It wouldn't even grow. It would grow worse. It would atrophy. And that's what digital dementia and digital deduction is. The high reliance on technology where we don't have to maintain a level of mental fitness. And so I would encourage people to be able to exercise their brain like they exercise the rest of their body. Wow, that's a that's a pretty good way to end all this. So, all right, I, I ask everybody who comes on the program, give, give our listeners one thing they can do today to get a better brain. Just, just one thing. How do we start? Yeah. Just one. Absolutely. I would say this. I would say first, oh, God, I'm going to take like 10 things. Yeah, I only want one. One thing, one thing. <laughs> I would, I would say this, I would say sit down and design your morning routine, your morning routine. My, everybody has their morning routine of the things that they do to win that day. Because if you want to win the day, you have to win that first hour of the day. First you create your habits and your habits create you. My morning routine, if people Google it or we did a whole podcast episode on it, millions of downloads and views on this, 
Jim Quick's morning routine focuses on the brain. The 10 things I do every morning to jumpstart my brain. And I would just say, find something in the morning for you instead of picking up the phone because that's rewiring your brain to be distracted and it's rewiring your brain to be reactive to things that will hurt your peace of mind, your positivity, your productivity, your performance. I would say replace picking up your phone with one thing that's good for your brain, whether it's eating a good brain food, taking deep diaphragmic breaths. Some fun thing I, I teach people to do is brush their teeth with the opposite hand because it engages the opposite side of your brain because as your body moves, your brain grooves. But what it really does is it forces you to focus first thing in the morning because you can't be doing that and being distracted. So it trains your fit, your, your focus and your presence muscles. And that's how you're going to achieve the most because the most important thing is to keep the most important thing, the most important thing. So my challenge with everybody, look at your morning routine and replace picking up your phone with something else that's more brain friendly. All right, everybody. Now, can everybody remember that, please? You <laughs> got to brush your teeth with the other hand. And actually, I'm going to add something. While you're brushing your teeth, you have to do deep knee bends. You got to oh, do oh. squats. You're just sitting there anyhow, just standing there. I like. Do some, yeah, do some deep knee bends and brush your teeth with the opposite hand. Okay, that's the lesson today. <laughs> Jim, thanks so much for being here. Uh, where do, where do people find you? Yeah. They probably already know, but just tell us how to how to figure you out. We we have a podcast. You can search Jim Quick. You just have to spell it right. K-W-I-K in your podcast app. Every episode's only 15 minutes on how to remember names, learn languages, change your habits, all of that great stuff. Um, you can find that at quickbrain.com. And the book, limitlessbook.com, is where you'll get all the links around the world, because I know your audience is global. So we have put all the links conveniently there for you to find the book. And we are gifting on that page a free book club, where we spend one week per section of the book to help you read and remember and apply it. And two bonus chapters there, Limitless for Kids and Limitless for Your Team, How to Apply the Limitless Model to Those Areas. And that's at limitlessbook.com. And I would actually challenge everybody right now is to take a screenshot of this episode. The fastest, my last tip for everybody, the fastest way to learn something is to learn with the intention of teaching somebody else. So I would say one of the ways you could do that, take a screenshot of this episode right now, tag Dr. Gundry, tag myself, at Jim Quick, post it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and share the one aha from this conversation. What is one small, simple step that you could take to better your brain. The same question that I was asked here, what's one, sim one simple tip that people could do? What's one simple thing that you're gonna do to better your brain? Post that in the description or take a picture of your notes and post it, tag us both in it. And I'll actually repost my favorites because that way I could see it if you're following and tagging me. And I'll actually send a copy of Limitless to a couple of my favorite answers just as a fun. Uh, Great idea, yeah. great idea. And uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll send off a longevity paradox to the first few folks that we like as well. Me. We've done that. That'd be, that'd be fun. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Big fan. And uh, uh, please enjoy the longevity paradox. And I've certainly, thoroughly enjoyed Limitless. And I'm going to, doggone it, I'm going to learn French. And I'll call you in French. <laughs> All right. Mary. All right. Thanks for being here today. Merci beaucoup. All right. So it's time for the audience question. Elton Hay asks on drgundry.com, have been on the plant paradox diet for approximately one year, but still have knee and hip and lower back stiffness and pains. Anything in particular that can be done to address these issues? I am 79 years old and in reasonably good health. Well, I read this... Uh, actually earlier and I had a chuckle and of course my first uh, chuckle was, well, if I could turn back the hands of time and make you 30, uh, that would be a start. But in all seriousness, uh, recently my, uh, my wife and I, I'll, I'll turn 70 in a month, my wife uh, just turned 70 a couple months ago and uh, injured her knee uh, skiing this, this year and uh, that she's an avid tennis player and now her knee hurts when she plays tennis. And we've tried actually all of my wonderful tricks, uh, 
the supplements that we use, and I could name them, but I'm going to give you another trick that is actually really working right now. Uh, I have mentioned on a previous podcast that I've been fascinated with uh, red and near-infrared light therapy for a variety of uh, things, and you're going to learn a lot about it in the next book, The Energy Paradox. And I have used this device on a shoulder that I injured. I've used this device on my knee. And my wife um, understandably chuckles and says, yeah, yeah, okay. So, you know, I'm so happy that's working for you. Well, she's been kind of frustrated. So for the last uh, week and a half, I said, look, you got nothing to lose. Why don't you, you know, get out my little box uh, of red light therapy? And I have no relationship with this company, but it's a Juve, J-O-O-V-V, and put it on your knee for 10 minutes a day. And she's been doing that now for a week and a half, almost two weeks. And I got to tell you, her knee pain is pretty much gone. It flares a little bit when she plays tennis, but she puts the light on it. She doesn't need ice. She doesn't need anything else. And she said, what the heck is this doing? And you're going to have to get the energy paradox to find out. But that's one thing. Get yourself a light box or, alternatively, get yourself a sauna. And I think there's some really important things happening at the mitochondrial level that can really help you with this. So great question. So. Give it a thought. Okay, review of the week. Uh, Luke Adrian on YouTube wrote, Dr. Gundry's ability to carefully listen to his guests without interrupting them ever is truly an ability most people have lost these days. <laughs> well, thanks for saying that. Um, I really like uh, our podcast to be a forum where people can have different opinions, present their ideas. I really like to hear them. Um, many of you have requested that I slice some of my guests into small, thin ribbons and spit them out and throw them on the floor. But that's not what this is here for. Um, this is to get differing opinions and listen to them. And I think I've talked about this before. Surgeons in general don't listen. We actually really enjoy having people asleep and cutting them open. I'm just joking. But one of the things that I learned when I transitioned into what I do 20 odd years ago now is to listen to people. And so that's what you're going to find here. You're, you're going to find us listening to people. And uh, thanks for noticing that. Uh, that's, I'm doing it on purpose. So thanks a lot. Okay, that's it for this week's Dr. Gundry podcast. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.